This is a very weird sort of story um, from a book called The Fairy Legends and Traditions of the South of Ireland by Thomas Croft and Croker in 1906. There lived, not long since, on the borders of the county Tipperary, a decent, honest couple whose names were Mick Flanagan and Judy, Judy, Judy Muldoon. These poor people were blessed, as the saying is, with four children, all boys. Three of them were as fine, stout, healthy, good-looking children as ever the sun shone upon, and it was enough to make any Irish man proud of the breed of his countrymen to see them about one o'clock on a fine summer's day, standing at their father's cabin door, with their beautiful flaxen hair hanging in curls about their head, and their cheeks like two rosy apples, and a big laughing potato smoking in their hand. A proud man was Mick of these fine children, and a proud woman too was Judy, and reason enough they had to be so. But it was far otherwise with the remaining one, which was the third eldest. He was the most miserable, ugly, ill-conditioned brat that ever God put life into. He was so ill-driven that he never was able to stand alone or to leave his cradle. He had long, shaggy, matted, curly hair, as black as the sun. His face was of a greenish-yellow colour. His eyes were like two born and cowls and were forever moving in his head as if they had the perpetual motion. Before he was a twelve month old he had a mouth full of great teeth. His hands were like kites claws and his legs were now thicker than the handle of a whip and about as straight as a reaping hook. To make the matter worse he had the appetite of a cormorant and the whinge and the yelp and the screech and the yowl was never out of his mouth. The neighbours all suspected that he was something not right, particularly as it was observed when people, as they do in the country, got about the fire and began to talk of religion and good things. The brat, as he lay in the cradle, which his mother generally put near the fire place that he might be snug, used to sit up and they were in the middle of their talk and begin to bellow as if the devil was in him right earnest. This, as I said, led the neighbours to think that all was not right. And there was a general consultation held one day about what would be best to do with him. Some advised to put him out on a shovel, but Judy's pride was up to that. A pretty thing indeed that a child of hers should be put on a shovel and flung out onto a dunghill, just like a dead kitten or a poisoned rat. No, no, she would not hear of that at all. One old woman who was considered very skilful and knowing in fairy matters strongly recommended her to put the tongs in the fire and heat them red hot and to take his nose in them and that would beyond all manner of doubt make him tell what he was and where he came from for the general suspicion was that he had been changed by the good people. But Judy was too soft-hearted and too fond of the imp, so she would not give in to this plan, though everybody said she was wrong, and maybe she was, but it's hard to blame a mother. Well, some advised one thing and some another. At last, one spoke of sending for the priest, who was a very holy and very learned man, to see it. To this Judy of course had no objection but one thing or other always prevented her doing so and the upshot of the business was that the priest never saw him. Things went on in the hallway for some time longer. The brat continued yelping and yowling and eating more than his three brothers put together and playing all sorts of unlucky tricks for he was mighty mischievously inclined till it happened one day that Tim Cardle the blind piper, going his rounds, called in and sat down by the fire to have a bit of a chat with the woman of the house. So after some time, Tim, who was no churl of his music, yoked on the pipes and began to bellows away in high style. 
when the instant he began, the young fellow who had been lying as still as a mouse in his cradle sat up, began to grin and twist his ugly face, to swing about his long, tawny arms and kick out his crooked legs, and to show signs of great glee at the music. At last nothing would serve him but he should get the pipes into his own hands, and to humour him his mother asked him to lend them to the child for a minute. Tim, who was kind to children, readily consented, and as Tim had not his sight, Judy herself brought them to the cradle and went to put them on him. But she had no occasion, for the youth seemed quite up to the business. He buckled on the pipes, set the bellows under one arm and the bag under the other, worked them both as knowingly as he had been, as if he had been twenty years at the business, and lilted up Sheila Nagurde in the finest style imaginable. Now this is the air of uh, Sheila Nagurde. Um, it's a song um, from Irish Melodies by Thomas Moore. Um, oh, had we some bright little oil of our own? But it's the it says there the the, the air is Sheila Nagurde. So anyway, they lilted up Sheila Nagurda in the finest style imaginable. All were astonished. The poor woman crossed herself. Tim, who as I said before, was dark, in other words blind, and did not well know who was playing, was in great delight. And when he heard that it was the little Prechon, not five years old, right, Prechon is another word for crow, they had never seen a set of pipes that, no, like, when he heard it was the little Prechon, not five years old, that had never seen a set of pipes in his life, he wished the mother joy of her son, offered to take him off her hands if she would part with him, swore he was a born piper, a natural genius, and declared that in a little time more, with the help of a good, of a little good instruction from himself, there would not be his match in the whole country. The poor woman was greatly delighted to hear all this, particularly as what Tim said about a natural genius quietened some misgivings that were rising in her mind, lest what the neighbour said about his not being right might be too true, and it gratified her moreover to think that her dear child, for she really loved the whelp, would not be forced to turn out and beg, but might earn decent bread for himself. So when Mick came home in the evening from his work, she up and told him all that had happened and all that Tim Carroll had said, and Mick, as was natural, was very glad to hear it, for the helpless condition of the poor creature was a great trouble to him. So next day he took the pig to the fair, and with what it brought set off to Clonmel, and bespoke a brand new set of pipes of the proper size for him. In about a fortnight the pipes came home, and the moment the chap in his cradle lays, laid eyes on them, he squealed with delight, and threw up his pretty legs, and bumped himself in his cradle, and went on with a great many comical tricks, till at last, to quiet him, they gave him the pipes, and he immediately set to and pulled away at Jig Pultog, to the admiration of all that heard him. Now we don't know does um, Jig Pultog is that the actual name of the tune or does Pultog mean a slip jig? Um, but I've put in Pultog and there's no um, translation of Pultog at all 
But I did come across this piece of music and it's called Jig Pull Tog, the Slip Jig. So I don't know, does it just mean Slip Jig or is it a Slip Jig? Here goes, a little bit of it. So he immediately said to and pulled away at Jig Pultog to the admiration of all that heard him. The fame of the skill on the pipe soon spread far and near, for there was not a piper in the next six counties could come at all near him. In old, in old Madra Rua, here's a bit of on Madra on Madra Rua. So no one could, there was not a piper in the next six counties could, could come near at all to him in old Madra Rua or the hair in the, in the corn. Or the fox hunter's jig. Or the rakes of casual. Or the Piper's Maggie. Or any of the fine Irish jigs which make people dance whether they will or no and it was surprising to hear him rattle away on the fox hunt you'd really think you heard the hounds giving tongue and the terriers yelping away behind them and the huntsman and the whippers in cheering or correcting the dogs it was in short the very next thing to sing the hunt itself 
Now he calls that there the fox hunt. Um, it's interesting that the first tune he mentioned was the old Madara Rua. Um, that's also the same name for this tune. So a Madara Rua just means a fox in Irish. So sometimes it's called the fox hunt, sometimes it's called the fox chase. And then he, I did play a tune at the start called Madara Rua, but he could mean this one as well because this is the one really where the the hounds are, are yapping and the terriers are yapping and everything else. So I won't play all of it, but this is Liam O'Goughlin playing a bit of it. I think the Chieftain's done a version of it as well. Yeah, so this is the Chieftain's doing that bit, and it's it's right, um, the way it says, uh, in the fox hunt, you'd really think that you heard the hounds giving tongue, and the terriers yelping away behind, and the huntsman and the whippers in cheering and correcting the dogs. It was, in short, the very next thing, the seeing the hunt itself. It's a bit of the Chieftain's doing that. The best of him was, he was no way as stingy in his music, and merry and merry dance the boys and girls of the neighbourhood used to have in his father's cabin, and he would play up music for them, and they said it, and they said, used as it were put, quick silver in their fee, that they said, yeah, that they said used as it were put quick silver in their fee. And they all declared they never moved so light and so early to any piper's playing that ever they danced to. But besides all his fine Irish music, he'd one queer tune of his own, the oddest that ever was heard. For the moment he began to play, everything in the house seemed disposed to dance. The plates and the porringers used to jingle on the dresser. The pots and the paw hooks used to rattle in the chimney, and people used even to fancy that they felt the stools moving from under them. But however it might be with the stools, it is certain that no one could keep long sitting on them, for both old and young always felt the capering as hard as ever they could. The girls complained that when he began this tune, it always threw them out in their dancing, and that they never could handle their feet rightly for they felt the floor like ice under them, and themselves every moment ready to come sprawling on their backs or their faces. The young bachelors that wished to show off their dancing and their new pumps, and their bright red or green and yellow garters swore that it confused them, so they never could go rightly through the heel and toe or cover the buckle or any of their best steps but felt themselves always all be dizzied and bewildered. And then old and young would go jostling and knocking together in a frightful manner. And when the unlucky brat had them all in his had them all in this way, queerly gigging about the floor, he'd grin and chuckle and chatter for all the world, like Jacko the monkey, when he has played off some of his roguery. The older he grew, the worse he grew. And by the time he was six years old, there was no standing the house for him. He was always making his brothers burn or scald themselves and break their shins over the pots and stools. 
One time in harvest he was left at home by himself and when his mother came in she found the cat a horseback on the dog with her face to the tail and her legs tied round him and the urchin played his queer tune to them so that the dog went barking and jumping about and puss was meowing for dear life and slapping her tail backwards and forwards which as it would hit against the dog's chaps he'd snap and bite and there was the philoleo another time the farmer with whom mick worked a very decent respectable man happened to call in and judy wiped the still with her apron and invited him to sit down and rest himself after his walk he was sitting with his back to the cradle and behind him was a pan of blood for judy was making pig's puddings the, the, the lad lay quite still in his nest and watched his opportunity till he got ready a hook on the end of a piece of twine which he contrived to fling so handily that it caught on the bob of the man's nice new wig and soused it in the pan of blood. Another time his mother was coming in from milking the cow with the pail on her head. The minute he saw her he lifted up his infernal tune and the poor woman letting go of the pail clapped her hands aside and began to dance a jig and tumbled the milk all the top of her husband who was bringing in some turf to boil the supper in short there would be no end to telling all his pranks and all the mischievous tricks he played soon after some mischances began to happen to the farmer's cattle a horse took the staggers a fine veal calf died of the black leg and some, of, um, and some of the sheep of the red water. The cows began to grow vicious and to kick down the milk pails. And the roof of one end of the barn fell in. And the farmer took it in his head that Mick Flanagan's unlucky child was the cause of all the mischief. So one day he called Mick aside and said to him, Mick, you see things are not going on with me as they ought. And to be plain with you, Mick, I think that child of yours is the cause of it. I'm really falling away to nothing with fretting, and I can hardly sleep on my bed at night for thinking of what may happen before the morning. So I'd be glad if you'd look out for work somewhere else. You're as good a man as any in the country, and there's no fear but you'll have your choice of work. To this Mick replied that he was sorry for his losses, and still sorrier that he or his should be thought to be the cause of them. That for his own part, he was not quite easy in his mind about that child, but he had him and so he must keep him, and he promised to look out for another place immediately. Accordingly, next Sunday at chapel, Mick gave out that he was about leaving the, leaving the work at John Reardon's, and immediately a farmer, who lived a couple of miles off, who wanted a ploughman, the last one having just left him, came up to Mick and offered him a house and a garden and work all the year round. Mick, who knew him to be a good employer, immediately closed with him. So it was agreed that the farmer should send a car to take his little bit of, for of furniture and that he should remove on the following Thursday. When Thursday came, the car came according to promise and Mick loaded it and put the cradle with the child and his pipes on the top. And Judy sat beside it to take care of him, lest he should tumble out and be killed. They drove the cow before them. The dog followed, but the cat was of course left behind. It is a piece of superstition with the Irish never to take a cat with them when they're removing. And the other three children went along the road, picking ski horries, which are haws, and blackberries, for it was a fine day towards the latter end of harvest. They had to cross the river, but as it ran through a bottom between two high banks, you did not see it till you were close to it. The young fellow was lying pretty quiet in the bottom of the cradle till they came to the head of the bridge, when hearing the roaring of the water, for there was a grey flood in the river as it had rained heavily for the last two or three days, he sat up in his cradle and looked about him, and the instant, and the instant he got a sight of the water and found that they were going to take him across it. Oh, how he did bellow and how he did squeal. No rat caught in a snap trap ever sang out equal to him. Wish the lana, said Judy. There's no fear of you. Sure, it's only over the stone bridge we're going. 
Bad luck to you, you ill rip, cried he. What a pretty trick you've played on me to bring me here. And still went on yelling, and the further they got on the bridge, the louder he yelled, till at last Mick could hold out no longer. So giving him a great scalp of the whip he had in his hand, Devil choke you, you brat, he said. Will you never stop bawling? A body can't hear their ears for you. The moment he felt the tong of the whip, he leapt up in the cradle, clapped the pipes under his arm, gave a most wicked grin at Mick, and jumped clean over the battlements of the bridge down into the water. Oh, my child, my child, shouted Judy. He's gone forever from me. Mick and the rest of the children ran to the other side of the bridge and looked over. They saw him coming out from under the arch of the bridge, sitting cross-legged on the top of a white-headed wave and playing away on the pipes as merrily as if nothing had happened. The river was running very rapidly, so he was whirled away at a great rate, but he played as fast, aye, and faster than the river ran. And though they set off as hard as they could along the bank, yet as the river made a sudden turn round the hill about a hundred yards below the bridge, by the time they got there he was out of sight, and no one ever laid eyes on him more. But the general opinion was that he went home with the pipes to his own relations, the good people, to make music for them. <laughs>